Right. Give this a second to stabilize. Wait for the streams to stabilize, the internets to calm down. All right. Well, hi, everyone. My name is Fraser Kane, and this is your uh, virtual star party for June 2nd, 2013. And we've got a, uh, a very restricted group tonight, so I'm not sure we're going to be going for too long, but we've got four astronomers. Well, three and a half astronomers. Well, two... Two astronomers for sure. <laughs> one whose focus is a little off. The other one has got some forest fires. One who's got to go to work shortly, and one who who we can't hear him. But but we're going to do the best we can to uh, to put on a show with uh, with what we've got today. Um, and everyone else is uh, busy or rained out or hurricaned out. So uh, so I'm just going to introduce everybody who's here. Um, We've got, so we've got Andrew Dumbleton, who is the one who's going to be heading out to work because he's in the uh, United Kingdom, but he's bringing us a beautiful view of the moon, even though it's like daytime, a daylight moon. Oh, you've put it right into your uh, right into your lower third, which is great. So, hi, Andrew. Morning, Fraser. I Good morning. You a bit there. So, what time is it there for you? Uh, we're about ten past five in the morning, so it's it's bright daylight. As you can see. Yeah, and so that moon that you're going to be showing us in a second is definitely going to be bright daylight. And so feel free to uh, to check out and uh, go to work when you need to. No problem. Okay. We won't hold it against you. <laughs> we'll do. Uh, now we got Bill McLaughlin. I don't think he can hear us. So he's uh, working through some kind of technology issue. So we'll uh, we'll sort of, when he says, oh, I can hear you, then we'll, we'll sort of get him up to speed. Uh, and we've got Gary Ganella. You can definitely hear us. Yes, I can. Located in, in L.A. And you got some forest fires in the neighborhood? Not, yeah, ways away, but a lot of smoke. Yeah. There's a big one burning up uh, by Magic Mountain. What does, what does smoke tend to do to the, to the view that you're doing? I mean, obviously, it obscures it, but, but doesn't it sort of obscure things more on, on the, like, does it obscure more the red spectrum or the blue spectrum? You know, I don't know. I've never really shot through smoke. I've never looked it up. So an interesting thing to check on, though, what it would do. Yeah. I know My that... headset is working. Um, oh, there we go. My microphone seems to be working. I'm getting sound from my system, but I'm not getting anything from Google+. Plus. We can hear you. But, he can't even tell him. But he can't hear us. He can't hear that you can hear him. He can't hear that we can hear him, yeah, yeah. So maybe I should I should put a the speakers lower. doesn't make any difference. I'm gonna have to mute you, Bill. Yeah, you can't hear from the speakers. Anyway, um, uh, and then we got Roy Salisbury, who's uh, located in Las Vegas. <laughs> there we go. Oh, there's cool. a sign. For... <laughs> turn on the chat. Turn on, turn on the chat, Bill. <laughs> we can talk to you there. Um, Roy Salisbury in uh, Las Vegas yes. operating remotely his uh, super observatory from uh, a state away. Yes. These You're in another state. Bunker. So how's... Now, you're saying that you're having a bit of a focus issue tonight? Yeah, I'm having some problems getting a, a focus locked in for some reason. I don't know what it is, but I'm working through it. Yeah. Well, we'll we'll sort of see what uh, as you work through it. We'll see where we get. Like I said, this might be a, the shortest uh, virtual star party ever. I, um, and then I know that uh, all a lot of the folks on the East Coast are all totally rained out. Um, Scott is in Hawaii right now, and uh, and and others are busy. So, all right. Well, I'm gonna get first. I don't. Know, did, did we lose Andrew's moon? All right. Well, then, why don't you show us? Tell us what object you're looking at, Roy. Uh, this is M108. It is a galaxy. <laughs> well, this is, I mean, you guys were complaining about this before we even started the show tonight, that this is, this is no season now, right? It's not galaxy right. season, really. It's not nebula season. It's not cluster season. It's not, there's no planets. It's really, we're in between. Yeah, you've, you've still got the, a lot of the galaxies up um, at the beginning of the night, but they're the same galaxies you've seen for the last four months. Yeah. So yeah, they get a little the, old. So trying to find new things is not really this time of year is with our weekly star parties. It's uh, not a lot of new stuff. The the nebulas don't start coming up until about uh, midnight or one o'clock in the morning. Right now, yeah, all the good stuff's just hanging right there on the horizon. So, what yep. are some of the objects that you're looking forward to seeing? Um, 
I want to actually want to try with this new scope. I want to try M57, the Ring Nebula. Yeah. So uh, that's going to be an interesting one to see, and then get back into M16, um, get back into things like uh, well, Rosette's going to be a little later in the year. But the Lagoon uh, and the Triffid. Yeah, the Triffid to be another good one. It's a really good, colorful one. Hey, look at that. Scott Lewis was able to make it from, I, what, from Hawaii? From Hawaii, yeah. Nice. I'm in Kona right now. Are you we really? Just, we just got back from the beach, and I saw you're on air, so I thought I'd stop by and say hi. Right on. We're having some, we're having some technical issues uh, today, but, uh, you know. It's, it's all good. What, what are we looking at? I got a little bit of time. Uh, well, we got uh, right now. Roy's pointing at 108. We're just talking about how we're in this sort of in this lull in between galaxy season, the same galaxies we've been watching right. for the last couple of months, and the wonderful nebulae that all start to pop up in the uh, in the summer. So, right, absolutely, yeah. And so this is M108, uh, which is in uh, Ursa Major. No, it's in the Virgo supercluster. Yeah, and it's in Ursa Major. So, which is the uh, which is the Big Dipper? I'm trying we're, to it, get my photos up. I was just at Mount Akea, and I want to brag. You guys oh, really? have cool telescopes, yeah. huh? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I got a bunch of awesome pictures. How did that go? Did you, did you go up oh, the... We went to the summit. Yeah, yeah. we're up at 14,000 feet, and absolutely amazing. And watching the sunset, and then I got to see the Southern Cross for the first time in my entire life, which was amazing. Like, I've, that's oh. one of my favorite constellations, and actually getting to see it with my own eyes was fantastic. That's great. Now, Thad last week was saying that if you get up to that altitude, you actually have a difficult time seeing the stars. Were you having any problems seeing the stars? Um, not too bad. I mean, we watched the sunset, and so we saw Venus come out first, and it wasn't. We but we went down to the visitor center, which is around nine thousand feet, to do our observations. So I had my binoculars out. We did some star trails and things like that, but. Uh, but no, the the skies out here, man. Oh uh -huh. wow! There we are. Oh, the skies are gorgeous. Like, what's light pollution? I they don't have it out here at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know it's just going to be phenomenal. I'd love I'd love to go back there and and do it. But I, you know, I remember when we were there. You know, your car rental companies won't let you drive up there because it totally voids the contract. How was the road going up there? It wasn't too bad. I mean, we had a four by four, so we had a jeep. Yeah, and so yeah, it was it was fine going up, because um, there's only maybe maybe two and a half miles until you have paved road again, and then yeah. it's paved the rest of the way up, and it's it's gorgeous. And what and kind of facilities do they have for regular folk? Like, if you want to go and you want to go to Hawaii and you want to visit the observatories, I mean, are there information centers? You know, yeah, there's a there's a visitor center there that's open. They have hot chocolate because it's a little cold out there. Yeah, and they have amateur astronomers out there with their telescope and doing star parties there all the time. Really? And so it was great. So they're doing a star party show while we were while we were just doing our own thing, looking at the different constellations. You can see the Milky Way with your naked eye. It was it was just gorgeous. Well, just, well I was uh, I went camping this weekend out on the west coast of uh, of Vancouver Island, mm -hmm. and my goal was to be able to see Mercury for the first time. Because, oh yes, yeah. right, and it didn't work out. No, it was, just, it was, no, it was terrible weather. It's a it, the west coast is is just awful, and right. uh, you know so sometimes you know it's known for storms. Like a lot of people go out there to watch storms. That's that's what right. you can see from the west coast of Vancouver Island. So uh, no, today though the the weather was beautiful. It was beautiful, you know, blue skies, and so it would have been good tonight to be able right. to see it. But I had to I had to hit home. So so no, I brought all my my ass my uh, my camera, my sort of nice lenses. I was going to try and take some astro photos. Nothing, mm -hmm. no luck, Nothing? no love. Mm. Yeah. So trying to see if I can pull these pictures up, and they're taking their sweet time loading. Sure. Them. Well, bring them up when you when you get them. I want to sort sure. of move. Uh, so Andrew, I think uh, I'm I'm sort of show, showing off your uh, stream of the moon right now. It's just beautiful. Yeah, it's a bit uh, it's a bit light. I'm losing a lot of contrast because it is daylight. But uh, yeah, it's uh, a lovely crater uh, called Mare Humorum, which is the big one, and the the smaller one that's sort of uh, imposed on it or superimposed on it is called Gazendi. Well, I don't think a lot of people realize, you know, that you can see the moon during the day. We've, we've talked to people who've been, like, totally shocked and surprised that they can see the moon during the day. But it's such a bright object that, right. you know, that it's no problem. You could just keep following the moon for hours and hours, and you'd still be able to bring it into the, into the star party. 
Well, yeah, it's got such a an ang large angular size, and the albedo on it reflects so much light that it's so easy to see even when it's daylight out. Yeah. Yeah, just fantastic. Uh, I'm going to move to Gary's view. We okay. got uh, M81 and M82. Right. Is, and those are also under major. Yeah, the spiral and then uh, interacting with this one. And you can start to see a little bit of the bulge in the hydrogen alpha on a full color. This is quite uh, colorful, sticking out in red. Turn it to Scott. Say more about it. <laughs> I, I'm still looking at a completely different window. Okay. <laughs> oh yeah. Bring up, bring up your photos. I'm gonna sort of, I'm gonna bring up a, uh, I'm gonna bring up a sort of a Hubble v version of M81 so people can see what it looks like. Um, and compare and contrast. Compare. Uh, yeah. So you can see here. So that's M81. This is from Hubble, and obviously, you know, Gary's view from his uh, his light polluted. Uh, Observatory, but you can really make out that same structure. So you can see it's got these these spiral arms above and below, and that really big galactic core. And then here's Gary's view. It's a little twisted off to the side, but you can still see those those two spiral arms, that oh, really yeah. beefy galactic core, and see, then off to the side is is M82. See if you can grab Hubble's M82. Yeah, I will. I will. Um, it's so beefy. And so. These, I think these two are, are interacting, right? Yeah, M81 and M82 are, um, yeah, so M81 is the bigger one, M82 is the smaller one, and the two mm -hmm. are, are interacting. Right. Uh, but the amazing thing about M82, and I'm, like I said, I'm going to bring this one in here, is just this, especially, you can really see the kind of the, the starburst that's going on right now. Um, yeah. Check this out. What? That work? Oh wow! Yeah. 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 So that's that amazing. Oh, no, we're back. losing people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, okay. so when you get these these situations where you get these galaxies that are going through some kind of of galactic harassment, uh, things like that, the um, you get sort of gas getting compressed in the galaxy and so you have these periods of really active active star formation where the galaxy will use up a big chunk of its hydrogen gas and and produce these sort of active star formation and normally in right. our galaxy you know we're normally producing say one brand new star a year which which doesn't sound like a lot but think about like the length of time that the galaxy's been around the length of time that the universe has been around so there's a lot of stars that we're building and there's All a lot of stuff that goes into creating a star it's not just like and you're a star there's yeah. A, you know. <laughs> yeah but the uh, but like with with M82 here you know it's producing f you know f it's got uh, I'm trying to what's this, the act 10 times faster yeah so it's got 10 times the star formation that, that we're going through Right, comparatively. So you can see it's just like a, it's just a whole other level of star formation, and uh, and so you get, you can imagine being in that in that galaxy, there would just be, just be all these young new hot stars, all this nebulosity going on inside that galaxy. It would just be a, a sight to behold, and that's what you get when you get these collisions, you get these these harassments, you get these tidal tails that are stretching out between these galaxies, and they just start to uh, to undergo this star formation. I don't know, maybe you know the Milky Way went, went through phases of that in the past, and and now it's and now it's not. So very cool. Um, so Bill, how's your view going? Are you able to get anything from the? Still sky? a little bit of light. I'm working on it right now, though. Is it? Yeah. Well, you're more north, right? So we're actually having this conversation with with Gary that for for me, it's still really light out. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there's no way I could point a telescope at the sky, you know, from my location. Oh, you got some some images, Scott? Let's see. There you go. So this is at the summit of Mauna Kea, and let me see if I can pull up a few more. I'm sorry, these are just coming from my camera phone right now. We have our DSLR stuff that we haven't gone through completely yet, but there's that, and there's another observatory up there. I'm saying we were just we made it just in time for sunset because I I, I arrived, we kind of regrouped, and then went up to you know went up the mountain, and it's just amazing trip up there. It just it's you know you know driving through the through the clouds, getting up to the visitor center, then getting up to fourteen thousand feet, and watching everything around. It's it was amazing. 
I want one. Yeah, right? <laughs> one of those, yeah. Let, let's go have these. We'll go have these on it. <laughs> we can, we can timeshare one of the, the telescopes up there. But yeah, we, we took a, a load of pictures. So when, when we finally are able to go through all of them, I'm, there's going to be a few articles that are going to be put out from, from our trip out here. So it'll be fun. That's cool. That's so cool. I'm going to go back to Andrew's view here. It's getting a little uh, a little dimmer now. Did you switch uh, <laughs> locations, Andrew? Yes, I, I moved to the Mare Imbrium, uh, which you can't really see there, but on the side of it is this uh, wonderful flood-filled crater called the Sinus uh, Iridium, which is the Bay of Rainbows. And it's unfortunate it's, it's not darker because it's uh, fantastic illumination on this just at the moment. Um, uh, but as you say, I'm losing it, so uh, <laughs> what I'll do is I'll just try and run along the Terminator because uh, I think I shall have to leave in a minute. Uh, <laughs> so let me just run along and see what we've got. So you can see various pockmarked uh, regions of the moon. There's Mare yeah. again and some, some rather more interesting uh, highland areas. Uh, yeah, lots of craters there. Lots of craters. I know. I love the love your view. That's great. And so, if the term Terminator is the uh, is not uh, about a uh, a robot sent from the future to kill John Connor, it is a yes, it is it the is. line, but it's both. It is the line it's, on the moon that sort of is, separates the dark side from the uh, the light right. side. So it's the line of shadow right. across the moon, and that of course moves across the moon over the course of the lunar month. For us, so it's going right to left, always. That's just terrific. Okay, I'm going to move to uh, to Roy's view. What is that? Is that the sombrero? No, this is uh, NGC 4217. I believe some say it's like a, a companion to M106. So what was it? NGC 42... 4217? Yep. Oh. I don't think we've ever I'm seen that one before. I'm, that's why I'm trying to find his things that I've never taken a picture yeah. of. <laughs> so Companion Galaxy to M106. M106, yeah. yeah. That's really neat. Let me find another picture of it here. They all kind of look I've like yours. I've got to running, guys, but I did want to stop in well, and say hi. All right, well, con well, congratulations on your awesome trip. I hope you have a bunch more pictures for next week. Oh, yes, I'll, I'll have a bunch to put out in the next week or so. And so have fun, and right. I will see you next week for the virtual star party. All right, man. All right, cool. Bye. Bye. Yeah, I don't have a lot of information on NGC 4 No, there's, there's not a lot online. Not a, there's, there's a couple of pictures, um, some really good pictures, but uh, no real detail. Yeah. Canis Finis Finitesi. Very cool. That's great. But I mean, you can really, see, of course, you're seeing an edge on galaxy here, and you can see that the uh, the bulge, the central bulge, where you know where all the uh, you know you can see the stars above and be below the disk in the middle there, and you can see this kind of dark dust lanes along the the edge of the galaxy. And so this right. is the kind of thing that if we saw the Milky Way from seen edge on, this is what it would what it would look like. Now M one hundred six. Did you already image M one hundred six? You did, right? Can you get M one hundred six? No, I did. I did one hundred eight. Can you get one hundred six? Yeah, I should be able to get one hundred six. Yeah. And so that's nearby in the in the same. Sort of in the same constellation, right? And so you get these situations. I mean, so we have constellation. You know, we have a satellite galaxies around the Milky Way, right? We have the large and small Magellanic Cloud. We have various dwarf galaxies as well. And so, you know, these galaxies are in the process of being consumed, <laughs> really. You know, in some cases, they, you know, they'll they'll orbit us, and we'll sort of the tidal forces will draw stars to and from, or they'll just get actually gobbled up, and and that makes the galaxy grow larger and larger. In fact, this is the process that's going to happen between us and uh, Andromeda in the next 10 billion years or so, because Andromeda is is heading directly towards us. 
And so in about 10 billion years, the two galaxies will collide with each other and, uh, and form a giant elliptical galaxy. I like how they say collide. They collide. I know collide is such a, yeah, it's such a nebulous term, right? Because, you know, yeah. they're not actually going to collide. What you're going to get is you're going to get the situation that, that the stars are just going to pass through each other and, um, you know, the, the, the gas and dust, though, is going to collide and sort of meet in the middle. And that's what's going to sort of start off a whole new series of star formation in this, in this combined object. Um, it's strange, the okay, the uh, comment system is not working. So, um, just to let people know, you can you can make some requests if you want. You can also give us any comments or questions or feedback. Just go. You, if you're watching this on Google Plus, you can just make a post on my on my stream where I posted it in Google Plus. You can make a comment or a question on the event page, or you can post on the uh, on YouTube. Or if you want, just on Twitter, use the hashtag Star Party. And we'll we'll get it there. Uh, let's see. Uh, BTL 743 notes that you can see the Terminator on the phases of the Moon app. You can absolutely see the Terminator on the phases of the Moon app. And in fact, we just released it a big update to the phases of the Moon, which has high resolution. So before, as you expanded the view of the Moon, the resolution got a little worse. Uh, but now we put much much higher resolution images. So now as you as you expand the the, the moon, I'll sort of show you here. This works here. So this is our app. And so I don't know if it works, if you can see, but as you as you zoom in, it gets more and more high resolution. So you kind of can't, it never looks bad. <laughs> because before it used to look kind of low resolution, I felt really bad about it. I'm like, oh, I wish it looked really good. So now it's, now it's but the, the, the size of the app's a little bigger. Um, all right. So I'm going to move to Gary's view. This is uh, our favorite, the yeah. Owl Nebula. Awesome. And it's a companion galaxy that we're going to get called the Pussycat. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've, I've told our writers now that's, that's what they have to do. They have to call it the Pussycat. So if, they, mm -hmm. if they're going to write about the Owl Nebula, they also have to refer to it. So this is M97, and it's another uh, planetary nebula. So this is one of these situations where... You know, in the far, far future of a star's life, after it goes through the main sequence phase, it puffs out its outer layers of uh, of its atmosphere and sort of expands out into this red giant phase, and then compacts down, and you get this complicated structure of this atmosphere that sort of floats outward. And it all depends on the shape that you get. Really, all depends on the sort of how the 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 white dwarf in the middle is now spinning, or you know how its magnetic fields are sort of tweaking and torquing the the uh, the gases around the around the object and so uh, in this case it's a um, you know you get the situation where you've got these two lobes inside the gases that are being carved out by the by the you know the forces of this white dwarf star and so it looks like these eyes and I'm gonna and there was actually a really great um, description there was the uh, the ring nebula which is you know one of our favorites and how the Ring Nebula is really um, a, what is it, like a, a donut, it's actually a donut shape. And it's been, you know, the gas and dust is getting carved out in this donut shape. I'm going to bring up another view of the, of the owl here. Here. If you can see that. And for those who are curious, I also have a satellite in the left corner. Oh, do you? Yeah. Let's see. Or a laser beam. Could be. A oh laser yeah, beam. there it is, over on the left-hand side. Yeah. yeah. Stars shooting at each other again. But we can tell, right? When we see the just the line, we know that's a satellite. When we see the blinky blinky, then we it's know an that's a that's an airplane, right? Right. Yeah, Bill, have you got something there? I'm just seeing your. Oh, that's just. Yeah, I'm still. Too light, I'm afraid. I yeah. don't know. It's, uh, it's okay. not not so good here. So I'm just uh, waiting. Hopefully the uh, stars will get bright enough before the star party gets over. <laughs> uh, Ian uh, Caldecott asks, what is the app called? It's called Phases of the Moon. Um, Mike Perry is asking for the Ant Nebula. Do you know what the Ant Nebula is? That one doesn't ring a bell. Yeah, let me see. It's where is it located? 
constellation Norma. Is that in the southern hemisphere? Yeah, it's between Scorpius and Centaurus. So no, we can't get it. We, you know, we're all located in the northern hemisphere right now. So, is this a photograph or is this live, Gary? It's live. That's the this Ring is, Nebula. This is our first Ring Nebula of the season. Hey, nice. It's just over the horizon. Oh, that's awesome. And you that's taken without any binning, so I can get the maximum magnification on it. Oh, it looks fantastic. Oh. I was going to do it tonight, but he beat me. You still can. I did. You still can. You <laughs> that's fantastic. That's wonderful. But that's our buddy, the ring. And oh, I love that. My full, full view. Um, what else we got? Someone wanted to see M5 or M13. Those should be up. Yeah, I can do those. Or Gary can. Yeah. Um, and M60, someone's also asked for M61. 61, huh? Yeah, which is also in Virgo. M61, let me see if I can pull something yeah. out on that. All right, I'm going to move to Roy's view here. So, Roy, what is this? Is that the needle? Yeah, that's my favorite, NGC uh, 4565. I just like it because it's got... It's a pretty good size for my field of view, and it has got really good definition in it. Yeah, so this is uh, this is another edge on spiral galaxy. So it's really it's the same kind of thing that we were seeing before with that companion right. to M one hundred six. And so it's the same thing. You've got this this you know you're seeing the spiral galaxy, but you're seeing it edge on, and so you're getting this this dark dust lane along the edge there, and you can see the galactic. The galactic center, the halo, just sort of bulging out above and below the the edge of the of the galaxy. It's great. That's really gorgeous, Roy. Yeah. Um, well, these nights I'm just gonna do it all night long. So what's what's funny is that so so this was one of the galaxies that was discovered by Sil, Sir William Herschel, um, and it was one of the ones that Messier missed. So, you know, a lot of people think that it's, you know, it's bright enough, it's large enough that it really should be in the in the Messier catalog. And it sure looks like a comet. You know, you can imagine that that Messier would have put it down on his list of things to remember to not get confused by when he sees it. Um, but uh but yeah, it, it uh sort of had to be it was added by uh, Herschel. So we'll we'll let him slide. It's a big it's a big sky. <laughs> um, or he, you know, he he discovered it as a meet as a uh, as a comet like fourteen times, you know. Yeah. He just kept saying, "Oh, I found this new comet." Yeah, that's great. Um, forty-seven twenty-five. What's that? Can you do that one? Forty-seven twenty-five. Forty-seven twenty-five. Coma Berenices. Is that up right now? Let's see. That should be up. Um. Yeah. 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 Do you want to try that one? Um. As soon as I finish this uh, M one hundred six, I'll swing oh, sure. on over. Okay. Great. It's an all request. All request night. Yep. That's going to be very galaxy related. All right, I'm going to move back to Gary's view. Oh, you're still, still, still showing off the ring nebula. Yeah. Trying to get the um, exposure on M61. I, I Yeah, I, I really like the ring nebula. That You know, I have these these moments as an amateur astronomer, and this was one of them, was seeing the ring nebula for the first time. Because like, you see it in this book, you look it up in the sky and you find this object and there's, you know, this is what it looks like. It looks like that in just in your eyepiece under, you know, it's teeny tiny, but it's definitely there and you definitely see this view. It's just wonderful. For me, it was the uh, the dumbbell nebula. Yeah. That looks like an apple core. Well, I, I guess it depends on when you got your telescope, right? Like I got my telescope yeah. in, I think, June when I was like 13 years old. And so the first things I saw and learned to observe was the Ring Nebula, M13, um, 
uh, and then Saturn happened to be up, and so I was able to get Saturn at the time and the Moon, of course. And then, you know, as I went into fall, but all of my observing was really done over the summer because here on the West Coast, it just it's awful in the winter. It's, we never get any real clear nights. And um, cold. quick note, right here, I'm pretty sure that's a cosmic ray. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, I get them every once in a while, and that one looks like it came in almost parallel with the sensor. So it looks like it ran through and hit a bunch of pixels. Wow. Yeah. The drunk so, alien in his spaceship. <laughs> <laughs> so cosmic ray hit my detector. So you've got like a cosmic ray detector. Yeah, yeah. In fact, that's uh, an interesting thing. The astronauts in the space station uh, see the flashes with their eyes closed when the cosmic rays hit their eye. Yeah. Uh, so uh, now we did a whole episode on astronomy cast of about cosmic rays, but but these are actually particles. They're not they're not rays like sun you know sunlight. They're not in the visible spectrum or gamma radiation or X ray. They're they're actually particles that have been accelerated to sort of massive energies, and they're traveling at almost the speed of light. Yep, and they hit everything. Well, I mean, they, they actually sort of smash into the atmosphere, and then they get kind of exploded by the atmosphere. And so they have these uh, these great systems of detecting them. So if you want to detect them, you want to be out in, out in space. But they have these great uh, detectors. Um, what are they called? This HESS? But they can, they can see the sort of cascade of particles that come through the atmosphere when these cosmic rays smash into the atmosphere. And they can detect that and then sort of track back. And so I think the uh, the source. What was the source of cosmic rays? Um, yeah, some have really high high energies. So. So supernova and then active galactic nuclei. So these are the the um, uh, around supermassive black holes. You get this accretion disks. So you get all this material that's waiting to die, right? It's all piling up, and you can get these really high energy particles flowing out of them, and gamma ray bursts. So it's cool that you're detecting them. That is awesome. Yep. Um, so you got the. What have you got that's, now? That's a one minute of M61. I'm doing a two-minute exposure right now. The galaxy's right here. I can zoom in a little bit, but uh, again, my scope isn't the best for small galaxies, but you can see it there with the ring, with the spirals. I've got a two-minute one going right now. Yeah, it's definitely a very interesting galaxy, though. I'm going to get a view of it from Spitzer for you. Let's see if this works. So here's sort of the view from the Spitzer Space Telescope. Well, you can tell it's the same thing. Yeah, yeah totally. That's about it. Yeah. <laughs> But remember, people, the important thing is this is live, or as close yeah, as you can yeah, get yeah. to live. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As opposed to a uh, space telescope that costs billions of dollars to to launch. Um, so what's yeah, cool let's about see NASA about, let them use their telescopes like this? Yeah. So what's what's cool about this galaxy is that it's an it um, it's an act. It's got an active galactic nucleus. So um, you know. When in the in the olden days, um, there were these objects called quasars, and, and astronomers just didn't really know what they were. They knew there was really bright, point-like objects, but they were super far away, and they just didn't know what they were. In fact, um, I was watching uh, Cosmos just you know like a year ago, and in that, Carl Sagan was like, you know, what are these quasars? We don't really know what they are. You know, some astronomers think that they're bright galaxies, but now we know that they're these that they are the they are the actively feeding supermassive black holes. So, you know, astronomers have found a black hole at the heart of pretty much every single galaxy out there. And sometimes this galaxy is quiet and it's not doing anything. There's nothing's falling into it. And other times it's actively consuming and gobbling up material. And so then as it does, this material 
uh, piles up around the black hole, kind of, you know, waiting in line to die, <laughs> and and then and this material heats up and gets really bright, and so you get, and it starts to emit radiation. So, so the, this is not actually coming from the black hole itself; it's just coming up from the region just right around the black hole. And so you get this, you get these, you know, these streams, these jets of material that come out, and depending on on where this jet is facing, how we see it it changes sort of our perspective of the sort of what kind of an object it is. And so if we see it edge on, then it's one kind of, you know, active nucleus. And if we see it face on and we're actually looking straight down that jet, it's a quasar. And so well, this is an example of a galaxy that's going through an active feeding phase. And it's also a, um, uh, it's classified as a starburst galaxy. Yeah, an interesting little, uh, little bit, I remember in the 60s, when I first heard about quasars, and they basically said they were giving off more energy than is possible <laughs> because they assumed it was radiating yeah. in all directions. Yeah. And then they found out it's a very tight beam, and now it's possible. But for them to emit that much energy omnidirectionally would be, uh, doesn't fit our physics. Uh, Dale Jacobs asked, do we actually monitor Google Plus comments? Uh, we do monitor Google Plus comments. We also monitor them on YouTube and on Twitter. Uh, but it, you know, there's a lot of places that people can comment, and so we don't always sort of find all the spots. So, the best place to do it is to go to um, YouTube. If you want to make absolutely sure, the tool that we use to to gather the comments feeds them through onto onto YouTube quite safely. So that's that's what I recommend. Um, what else, man? More. Uh... This is um, this is the two minute exposure. I got a little bit more detail in it. Uh, so someone's saying, how about a couple of shots of 1998 QE2? So this is this big asteroid that flew past the Earth. Um, you probably could get it. it. If you see it at all, it would look like a star. A dot, yeah. 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 And so the, so, but if you sort of gathered a couple of images and sort of did a blink test, you'd probably start to see it. But I don't know if you're equipped to do that. Um, M got a request for M sixty three. I'm gonna go back to Roy's view here. Uh, Bill, have you got something updated? Or are you still still too light? Yeah, it's still too bright. Bill's in Oregon, so we were talking at the beginning of the show just how, you know, I'm sort of for here. It's I could just now start being able to show the night sky, and Bill's just a little south of me. So, uh, so Roy, which one is this now? That is uh, M one hundred six. That was the companion one. That's terrific. Looks really great. And uh, just since we're talking for any new uh, new people, Roy is in the middle of darkness. He's got yes. a remote observatory, and he can just look at light. I am in the Los Angeles light polluted basin, yeah. and I shoot with uh, nar very narrow band filters. I usually use hydrogen alpha, which is a red light, and it cuts everything else out but that light. So I see all the excited hydrogen in the universe. Uh, if I try to take anything with normal, uh, you know, without the filters, I just don't get a good picture. But Roy has a very dark location, and it makes a big difference. Yeah, these are these are three-minute luminance images. So just by, I mean, just by the fact that they're letting pretty much every bit of light through except for infrared, and I don't get the washed out background, you can tell how dark it is. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm jealous of Roy's setup, but uh, then again, when something breaks in mine, i got to walk about 20 feet to fix it. <laughs> yeah. So I'll show another example of, uh, of M106 here. Again, not, not to compare, but... So that's a view from um, Hubble, I think. That's from, yeah, from, it's a composite view. So you're seeing it in a bunch of wavelengths. You're seeing it in, in infrared, you're seeing it in x-ray, and you're seeing it in visible light. And so it's actually an example of a Seifert galaxy. So that's another kind of galaxy with an actively feeding supermassive black hole. But in this case, we're not seeing, like, down the, down the throat of the, uh, of, the, of the quasar of the supermassive black hole. We're seeing it sort of off to the side. 
But same thing, it's going through active star formation. Um, and the disk is kind of a little bit warped, but it's a, you know, it's just a terrific galaxy. And I wonder if it's happening from that, from its interactions with that, that uh, companion that we saw earlier. Entirely possible, I suppose. And I'm going to move to Gary's view again. Okay, that is a, um, a one-minute uh, bin 2x2 two two of M51. So I can zoom in a little bit, and I'm presently doing a uh, two-minute exposure. We'll and you're getting, that, uh, you're getting that satellite along the side there. Uh-huh. <laughs> it, it almost looks like it's a tumbling satellite, too, because it's... Changing in brightness, tell, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting. But uh, there's the M51 Whirlpool galaxy with the two that are interacting. And uh, when you get a high-res picture, you can see that there's a lane of stars and dust connecting the two. Yeah. So they're, they're doing the tango. Uh, BTL743 is noting that we've got... It's kind of quiet tonight. It is kind of quiet tonight. A lot more thoughtful tonight. And also, I'm trying to host and explain and track the comments and so on. So I can only think of so many things at the same time. I apologize to everybody out there. I didn't even try to read the comments. <laughs> I, yeah. I have a lot of trouble doing one thing at a time. So. Yeah, exactly. Um, but, uh, but yeah, no, it's definitely a lot more fun when we've got more people. So, um, uh, But yeah, M51, which is great. What a beautiful galaxy. Let me, uh, I should have the two-minute one. Here we go. A little bit now. Let me yes, let me stretch it a little bit. A little bit better exposure. Mm. So and this is actually the uh, this is our logo for the uh, for the virtual star party is your your image of M fifty one. Oh, is it? Yeah, cool. yeah, and it's also known as the uh, as the Whirlpool Galaxy. And of course, you can see this companion. The companion's uh, NGC fifty one ninety five, and they're undergoing a sort of you know, again, this sort of galactic harassment, this this gravitational harassment that we've been talking about. Um, yeah, it's just can you fantastic. Read a little bit more detail. Yeah, yeah. If you can bring it back, zoom it back in again. See part of the arm. I can go in quite a ways. This is also one that I think it was two years ago now had a supernova. Um, supernova in 2005. Yeah, and it was one in 2011. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I got pictures of that. Oh, did you really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's cool. I, yeah, people. A lot of people don't realize, you know, that a lot of the supernova that are that are discovered are often discovered by amateurs. There's a there's a great guy out of Australia who has got this phenomenal memory of the night sky, and he just moves from object to object, looks at each galaxy, goes, nope, nope. Nope. Oh, there's something new, and then he goes, "Oh, see," and he checks, and they're like, "Yep, yeah, there's a supernova." And so it's like one of the most prolific supernova hunters is, is, is an amateur scary. with a big telescope who just moves fast and just has a phenomenal memory of the night sky. Okay, let me see if we can find something else here. Uh, so people want to know what kind of scope you have, Roy. Um, this is a 10-inch uh, RC, so it's uh, it's it's sort of like Gary's telescope, but uh, it's just a, a a minor difference. Whereas the back mirror, it's a it's it's a two mirror system, um, but the back mirror doesn't move compared to the SCTs, which the back one moves to focus. So who actually made them? Is it an Astrotech Astronomics? Yeah. Yeah, this is uh, an Astrotech. If I can get a, a shot That's of what they look like. Roy? Yes, this is the newest one. Cool. Whew. Not a cheap telescope. No. I'm trying to find something else of interest, and I'm not having a lot of luck here. Well, we had a couple of requests. I don't know if, we, if we've already okay. done them all. M61 we got. What else we got? Uh, well, somebody wants... Um, so, Quinn Fitzpatrick wants to know, how wide is, is your view, Gary, in arc minutes? Uh, it is just about one arc minute high by one arc minute wide, one and a half wide. Arc minute or degrees? 
degrees. Yeah, yeah. Degrees, and a, and a sorry, degree yeah. is 60, 60 arc minutes, 60 right? 60 arc so, minutes, yes. Um, yeah, so it's so about it's, 60 by 90 arc minutes. Uh-huh. Yeah. It's like 63 by 92 or something like that, so real close. Um, so it's a wide angle. Yeah. Uh, and you, what have you switched to, right? That is uh, the requested uh, forty-seven twenty-five. Oh yeah, which is a little uh, trailing there. Temperatures changing enough where my focus is going out too. What's your uh, field of view on this scope, Roy? This one is... Oh, that's a good question. I can always, I always forget. So, this so the one is uh, 31 by 23 okay. degrees, or minutes. Minutes. Uh -huh. uh, so the neat thing about this one is it actually has one spiral arm. So you can't quite make it out in, in Roy's view here. But like with the with the Milky Way, it's got these it's got these two spiral arms, right? It's got the you know like this, right? I don't know if you can see it. Um, but this one, it's actually just got the one that sort of wraps around it. So I'm not sure what happened to the other one. There you go. There's Corey joining us for like five minutes, and then we'll be uh, shutting it down. Were there any other requests? Uh, Roy did 4725. Yeah, let me there? just see if we got them all. Um, right, so BTL743 wanted 4725, so there you go. Um, Miguel Zepeda asks, I have a Celestron SE Nexstar 8 SE. Can I get those galaxies and stuff you show here? What camera do you recommend? So absolutely, you can get these objects with that, with a with an 8-inch Nexstar. Uh, nope. No question. Mm -hmm. uh, the, yeah, the what you're going to miss, what you're going to get is the on that one. I believe that's a single a single arm mounted scope. Mm -hmm. um, you're not going to get as good a tracking, and they're not really good. They're not really made for astrophotography. But uh, sure, you could get some some short exposure stuff with that. You know, yeah. 30, 60 second exposures should be fine. I don't know. I guess I'm kind of a uh old school guy on that uh, on the subject of astrophotography uh, there's so many people I see and in, including myself that go through endless iterations of equipment and wind up spending five times what they should instead of you know buying the really solid mount uh, in the first place uh, right but it's it's hard to predict how much you want to spend on a given hobby when you're getting started so I, it can be difficult uh, you know do you buy the cheaper stuff and you know just dabble or do you buy the more expensive stuff where you're going to be less frustrated <laughs> it's a difficult thing to to know i do have something up here now oh, okay it's a little bit uh, faint and fuzzy i got another one i'm working on right now uh, it's uh, ngc 4244 so it's another edge on spiral. It's another edge on spiral. It's in Canis Finitisi, also known as Caldwell 26. What was it? 4244? 42, 44. 42, 44. Yeah. That's really cool. But you've got, you've still, I mean, you can see just how much brightness you've got still in the sky. It's going away now though, so I've, I've got another one I'm working on at the moment. And we'll give Corey a chance to blow us away here and then we'll, uh, we're gonna, we'll wrap up the start party. <laughs> that Gary's view we've seen. Yeah, I'm working on something. How's it working there, Corey? Can you hear us? He might not have his... Uh, Mike hooked up tonight. Let's see, do we get everyone's requests? I'm going to try um, a, a, one of the globulars and see what I M80. Someone wants M80. Yeah, and somebody wanted M13. 
Yeah, that's why I'm doing M13 now. Okay, great. I think we'll make that the last uh, the last couple objects. I should have one more to squeeze in here. Sure, that'd be great. I'm gonna let Corey squeeze one in, unless he can't hear us. Uh, Mike Zille is asking if we have time to look at the Eagle Nebula, and it's still solid up, right? Yeah, it's not. I can I can hear you. Do you want me to just queue something up quick, Fraser? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was we was gonna wrap up the star party now, so. Okay. Cool. Ah, another ring nebula. There's my ring. Needs a lot more exposures. <laughs> it's great though. You can start to see some of that kind of that nebulosity in the middle. I mean, it's not it's not just a ring. You also get this sort of really neat color right in the middle. Right. This was only sixty seconds, so there's a, there's there's a lot of noise in it still. Yeah. All right, I'm going to see Corey's view here. What do you got, Corey? 81 and 82. My guess, yeah. Yeah, and there's more in there, too. You can see another galaxy up at the top. That's great. And then, Bill, which is this now? That's NGC 5907. Another edge on spiral? Another edge on spiral. I'm just boring tonight. <laughs> and I've got a, uh, I've got a color one of it. I'm in, in a different scale. I'm going to bring up here in just a second. As soon as I get it, base processed. What, what method are you using to bring up the, the color images? Uh, that's just DSLR. The, uh, the one you're looking at now is a uh, TOA 130 with a uh, 11,000. Or excuse me, a, 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 a ST, SBIG uh, STT 8300. Um, and the color one here is a uh, Canon uh, 5D Mark III on a uh, mm. Stellar View refractor. And so you just have, that's right, I remember you had sort of all these telescopes on the same mount. So they're all just... Right, yeah, they're all on the same mount. So they're all viewing the same object, and then you can just switch the, the view. Exactly. Cool. And Corey, what have you got there? Is that Vega? One hundred and twenty seconds of Vega at eight hundred ISO. I'm guessing. That's really cool. All right. Well, I think I can see where this is going. So I'll let, I'll let you uh, start to bring up that last image. But I'm going to start to wrap stuff up now. So it looks like we've got everyone's requests. Uh, sorry, we weren't more active tonight. Uh, we left all our silly astronomers at, uh, at in other places tonight, but we'll get some entertaining people for you guys next week. So I won't have to be explaining and uh, running the show at the same time. So, uh, Roy, have, have you? Is that still the same one? You haven't done an updated process on this yet. Nope, I'm downloading M13 now. I'm just gonna take a minute right. or so. All right. Well, we'll get that. We'll get a view of that as soon as we can. Um. And Gary, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Okay, this is M80. You got M80? All right, let's see. And I just brought up a color uh, image of the same thing. Oh, great. Oh, it's really nice. I love the color views. Smaller smaller scope, uh, so a smaller, you know, image. Yeah. But... yeah, that's terrific. And Roy, thank you again. Uh, you're sorry, sorry you're having these focus problems tonight. Yeah, I just got to... Little teething problems. Just gotta. Get but is this something you can out reach out and, and handle remotely, or do you have to? Oh yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I can all do right. it all remotely. It's just uh, I got to get all my software all reconfigured for the cameras and the scopes. Yeah. And... Yeah. Yeah, and I wish I wish I could have been more help tonight, but uh, the the <laughs> sky doesn't want to get dark. No, yet. I know we're gonna. It's gonna be another couple of months before well, we can. I've got a friend of mine coming over next week to do some imaging, and uh, he said, "Yeah, he's coming over for the twenty minutes of dark that we actually have this time of year." <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I get even less. 
So by like on the twenty first, it's it's pretty much light until ten o'clock for sure. You can get around at ten o'clock at night. Our astronomical twilight uh, tonight starts at about eleven o'clock. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's still a little bit blue in the sky right now here on the West Coast. So, um, cool. Well, I'm going to wrap this up then. So, thanks everybody for watching. Uh, we're going to be recording a mountain of astronomy casts in the next week. So, if you have any interest in watching astronomy casts, uh, you, this will be your week. So, we're going to get a bundle of them recorded and try and catch up as much as we can. So, uh, just watch that uh, in the next uh, in the next few few days. So, sorry we couldn't be more crazy tonight. Uh, quiet, introspective, looking at galaxies. Uh, but thanks everyone for joining us, and thanks uh, thanks to all the astronomers for uh, for pitching in. We really really appreciate it. It's a wonderful view. Uh, and thanks for everyone's requests. All right. Well, we'll see you all next week. Thanks, everybody. Good night.